This is Access Ann Arbor. Intro tune I made up. Hello, I'm Laurel Fetterbush. The solar system. We used to have a toy mobile that was a model of the solar system when I was a kid. You probably had one too. Ours was made of cardboard with colorful representations of the Earth and all the other planets, with the Sun, of course, being in the center, and much larger even than Jupiter, the largest planet. Ever wonder how we came up with this idea of a solar system? Maybe you haven't ever wondered about that. It's just so much a part of our view of things that by now it seems totally natural, like seeing the sky is blue and the grass is green. Would it surprise you to learn that the idea of the solar system goes way back, like thousands of years? How far back? Well, the oldest written texts of ancient India, the Rig Veda, written sometime 1,000 to even 3,000 BC, they don't know exactly when, contains much of what is considered the science of astronomy today. It seems likely that the concepts actually go back farther to ancient times, but we can't say how far back since no earlier writings from ancient India have survived. Now, the Rig Veda, as you may know, is a religious text. The sacred writings of Hinduism and of the Vedic religion that preceded it. The mystics who wrote the Rig Veda reportedly got much of their inspiration from using hallucinogenic drugs, most likely red mushrooms, although the exact narcotic hasn't been identified. Red mushrooms have been linked to hallucinations, such as astral projection, or the sensation of traveling through outer space, which could explain a lot about the way astronomy developed. What is there from the Rig Veda that a modern astronomer could possibly agree with? Plenty. Here are just a few examples. It's from ancient Hinduism that we get the concept of the universe being cyclically created and destroyed. It's where the idea of an expanding universe came from. Incidentally, it's also where we get the concept of evolution from, not from modern science, but from ancient mysticism specifically from the idea of reincarnation, but that's a whole nother subject. Here's what's more relevant to our topic. One of the main features of ancient Hinduism was sun worship. The ancient Indians were heavily into sun worship. The sun was their main deity. So the Rig Veda describes the sun as the center of spheres, and the Earth is just one of many planets being held by the sun, the way a horse is held by its reins. This lays out the idea of heliocentricity, where everything rotates around the sun. 
The ancient Indian tradition also gives us a concept of the sun holding onto the planets through gravity called Guru Tvakarshan. I probably just butchered that word. In fact, I'm sure I did. Um, in the Sanskrit language, this word literally means to be attracted by the master. The sun's attractive force was always described as a masculine energy. So this theory ought to be rejected for its outright sexism. Later, Sir Isaac Newton would come up with a different but equally fishy way to explain gravity. He conjectured that an object can instantly affect another object without in any way touching it. It was an idea that Newton had gotten from his study of magic, just like waving a magic wand and causing a bunny to appear. But we'll get to Newton later. The ancient Indians thought that our sun was one of many, that the universe was full of suns just like ours, and that there were countless other worlds. We were nothing special. Another thing, the ancient Indians likely, I'm sorry, excuse me, the ancient Indians liked to think in terms of really, really big numbers, both in terms of distances and of years, millions, billions, trillions. That's where the concept of our universe being billions of years old and trillions of miles across comes from. The ancient Indians also believed that the Indian culture was millions of years old. But scientists today don't actually believe that. They don't think that Indian civilization went back millions of years. It would be a bit of an exaggeration, maybe a myth. But the part about the universe being billions of years old and trillions of miles across is taken at face value. Later, Indian astronomers and others would devise mathematical formulas to fit this model. But they never questioned the original premise, which came straight out of sun worship. Now, the Rig Veda is a beautiful sacred religious text, full of timeless wisdom for the ages. But scientific it isn't. So how is it that our modern science of astronomy is basically a carbon copy of what's in this text? Maybe the ancient Indians were psychic? Or maybe they were visited by ancient aliens who gave them all the answers? Maybe they were just way smarter than all the rest of humanity, and only their tradition managed to come up with the correct version of things that all the rest of the people around at that time were too stupid to grasp. Maybe they were just lucky guessers? Or is modern astronomy just taken unquestioningly from their writings? Things to consider. We'll cut to another related type of mysticism that was around back then in the ancient world. This one in Persia, which was right next to India. Modern day Iran, but more expansive in those days. Persia was the home of a religion called Mithraism after Mithra, a deity whom the Hindus called Mitra. This religion later turned into Zoroastrianism after the philosopher Zoroaster, who lived around five or six centuries BC. The Zoroastrians sort of worshiped the sun, but not exactly. They had an idea that the sun we see reflects its light from a greater central sun, which is actually God. By the way, I hope you like these pictures. I drew them myself. One guy who was influenced by this was the ancient Greek philosopher Pythagoras, the father of modern geometry. A squared plus B squared equals C squared was probably his greatest hit, known as the Pythagorean theorem, even though some people claim he stole that from Babylonian mathematicians who came before him. But Theorems weren't the only things he may have ripped off from other sources. It turns out that Pythagoras was also a cult leader. And his cult, Pythagoreanism, had a doctrine amazingly similar to Zoroastrianism, involving multiple suns, with our mundane or earthly sun reflecting its light from a higher sun, and that one in turn getting its light from another, and so on, with God being the ultimate source. 
Another doctrine of Pythagoreanism had to do with demons and how to contact them, but we won't go into that. Anyway, Pythagoras also had a belief about different shapes having different personalities, as it were. He decided that the Earth just had to be a sphere because that was the most perfect shape. Now, if that isn't scientific, I don't know what is. Anyway, one of Pythagoras' students, the philosopher Philolaus, mapped out a sort of version of our solar system, but in his version, he had the sun, the moon, the earth, and all the planets rotating around a great central fire, which he called Hestia, after the Greek goddess of the hearth. Now, this would be a feminist turn on the idea of a central sun. Philolaus had our earthly sun reflecting light from that central fire. Again, our sun just reflecting light from some greater source. Philolaus also believed that there were creatures roaming around on the moon. Maybe he was into those red mushrooms, too. Pythagoreanism made a comeback in the Middle Ages with Copernicus, who called his heliocentric or sun-centered version of things Pythagorean. Sun worship made a comeback then, too. People like Copernicus, as well as other intellectuals in Europe at the time, were talking about the sun as a lord or a king who deserved to be in the center. This is supposed to be the sun with a crown on it. The Age of Reason, or Age of Enlightenment, is usually described as a battle between church dogma and scientific rationality with the rational science winning in the end. Really, it was a battle between the biblical dogmas, I'm sorry, between the dogmas of biblical religion and those of ancient Ind Indian mysticism. The dogmas of the Eastern mysticism won in the end. There's a good reason for that, which is that the Eastern mystics had a corner on astronomy. Remember, the Bible instructs people to stay away from astrology whereas the Hindus and the Zoroastrians believed that astrology was crucial. Personally, I'm a Libra. I think astrology helps stimulate the imagination and brings a kind of colorful mythology to our daily existence. But the ancient Hindus and Zoroastrians took astrology very seriously. To them, it predicted the futures of individuals and nations and whether scientists like to admit it or not, astronomy developed directly out of astrology and was inseparable from it for most of history. So the Eastern traditions had developed a long, sophisticated system of studying the heavens, whereas those with a biblical outlook had nothing to compare to that. So the Eastern tradition of sun worship was the one that prevailed. Combined with the influences of Hinduism, Zoroastrianism, and the Greek philosophers was another strain of sun worship called Hermeticism. This was named after a figure called Hermes Trismegistus, or the thrice great Hermes. Hermes was the messenger god of the ancient Greeks, but Hermes Trismegistus was supposedly a combination of him and the Egyptian death god Thoth, or maybe he was one of the Egyptian pharaohs, or a prophet like Moses, or maybe just a monk. It's very confusing. But there were many writings that were attributed to him, and people like Copernicus and Sir Isaac Newton were heavily into him. In fact, Sir Isaac Newton did translations of his works. Hermeticism was all about astrology, alchemy, like, you know, turning straw into gold, and theurgy, that is, rituals to make contact with demons, demons again. Anyway, Copernicus quotes a passage where Hermes Trismegistus calls the sun the visible god, thus justifying heliocentricity, that is, the sun being in the center. Hermeticism also promoted the idea of, of free sex. No inhibitions, do it wherever and whenever you want which might help explain the popularity of Hermeticism. So that's where the idea of the solar system comes from. Since then, 
We've seen some realistic seeming videos claiming to show things in outer space. And we've had splashy, exploding rockets. So we think we've really made a lot of progress. There is, of course, another model of the universe laid out in the Torah of the Jews, the Bible of the Christians, and the Quran of the Muslims, all of which are remarkably similar to each other in this respect, and similar to other cultures as well, but totally different from the sun-centered cosmology can explain everything we see around us. Plus, it has the advantage of being a lot simpler than the Eastern ideas. And there's actually a scientific principle that the simplest explanation is most likely to be the correct one. But if you start talking about the cosmology of the Abrahamic faiths, where the Earth is down here and the sun and its friends are up in the sky, not that far away, shining down on us as they circle above the Earth, you'll be laughed out of the room. Or maybe on the way of throwing you out the door, someone will mention that this model goes against more than a few laws of physics. But lots of the laws of physics were specifically designed to fit the heliocentric model, so it's not really fair. It's like a rigged game. For example, gravity. There's exactly one thing we know that gravity does. Gravity makes things fall down. We don't know how it works. We can just see the results. There is no known force that can hold objects on a spinning ball. Try putting an object, say a paper clip, on top of a spinning ball. It'll go flying off. Gravity won't hold it there. But the theory is that gravity is what holds us onto the spinning ball of the Earth. Really. Also. Time and space being warped by matter. Is that really necessary to explain our daily existence? Name one thing you've seen in your life that can only be explained by such a theory. The skies move and the seasons change in a predictable way and have throughout all of human history. Yet we keep getting more and more bizarre theories about how things work as if the world could only be explained through such far out scenarios. Then we get serious people talking about the chances of us finding alien life forms on other planets. There isn't really any difference between science and science fiction as long as we have the current fictional model of our universe to work from. And because that's the model that's been drilled into us from childhood, we can't seem to imagine the universe being any other way. Even though the Earth doesn't appear to be a ball spinning around the sun, that's the only way we can imagine it being. No, we can't consider the model described in the Bible because it's ancient and faith-based. But our whole science of modern astronomy is built upon the faith-based assumptions of ancient sun worship. Now, I want to make it clear that my admiration for the sun is second to none. It gives us light, warmth, and all kinds of life-sustaining goodness, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for the sun. And we may yet discover many more wonderful and amazing things about it, but does that really mean that we need to base our astronomy on the sun being at the center and us being small and insignificant by comparison, just whirling around it in space, along with all the other celestial debris? Come to think of it, the moon is pretty cool. It's silvery, and it shines beautifully on the water. Maybe we should all be worshiping the moon.